what are the ethical issues of cybernetics? Uh, I think ethically, at the moment, there are questions with cybernetics and cyborgs, that humans and technology coming together. Um, for people with disabilities that are helped therapeutically, there's probably not too many questions. If you can help somebody with Parkinson's disease, or whatever the problem is, we should do it, clearly. But the same technology can then be used by people for enhancement. And this is where, at the moment, maybe there are questions in some minds, particularly if, take myself, and I enhance my abilities, my intellectual abilities, then maybe that puts me quite a bit ahead of other people. Now, everyone else who has implants and links with technology will also be enhanced. So this group of cyborgs probably don't have a problem at all. We're all enhanced, so what? But there might well be other people who still want to stay, if you like, some sort of subspecies of humanity. They don't want to change. They might have ethical problems with it. So I think an immediate ethical issue is the big picture. Who is happy with technological progress in this way and who not? History has always said we will move ahead with the technology and if some people get left behind, so be it. What would you say have been the biggest and most significant changes in technology in your own field, um, say over the last five to ten years? Um, I think what we've seen in my own field, which is looking at implants actually put in nervous systems and brains, um, is more of an experimental one. Um, the last implant that I had was the first human to have a brain gate implant. Now there are about four or five people that have had a similar implant in their brain, being able to control a robot hand just from their brain signals to get feedback from the hand as well. So I think it's more of an experimental one, which has changed people's minds to say, hey, this is possible. Now, technically, we can put an implant in a human brain. It can directly control technology. That can help people, but also it can take us forward. What are your predictions for technology going forward? Range of predictions. Um, first of all, if I take the Turing test, which is machines fooling you into thinking they're human, uh, I can't see it being very long before a machine or a number of machines pass the Turing test as Turing defined it. Uh, I think in the next year or two we're going to see that happen. And it will be a step on in artificial intelligence. Now communication means from a machine means that you can't tell the difference. Is it a human? Is it a machine? You don't know because machines are so good in that way. Um, in terms of implants helping people, I, I think maybe within 10 years we may see different neurological problems like schizophrenia being tackled technically. Um, and I, I see that not just using a piece of technology with electronic signals, but also using artificial intelligence. So effectively you are putting the power of a computer to analyze the signals in real time in the person's brain and to apply counteracting signals into the person's brain in real time to overcome the neurological problem. I think we're going to see that. So it's almost like putting artificial intelligence inside the person's head to counteract problems that there are of a neurological nature. The same thing could be true of someone with depression and so on. So a whole new area of medical treatment, biomedical treatment, I feel, with computer technology very central as a treatment. Do you think the interface between IT and humans has developed in the way that was initially predicted by science fiction writers over the years, or has it gone off on a serious tangent? Science fiction writers and scientists have often come up with quite accurate predictions. Um, 
Carol Chapek predicted nuclear weapons. Uh, we, we had Jules Verne predicting people landing on the moon. Even if we take Alan Turing, more a scientist, and he was looking at how machines are going to be able to communicate and so on. I think the big thing that people didn't seem to point out was networking um, and the internet and how powerful that has been and is and is continuing to be and how that changes humans as we see with the social networking side of things now. And it changes all sorts of different things. Um, I used to work for British Telecom many years ago and this, I guess, the, the late 70s, um, which is not that long ago, there was this thing called mobile phones or cell phones, which was a research thing at that time. And we were told, well, it's a research thing, but practically it will never happen because there are all sorts of problems with it and it would require masts put all over the country. No one's ever going to want to have anything like that. So it's not going to happen in practice. And clearly we've seen we've gone from that within a relatively short space of time to everybody must have something like that. You've got to have your cell phone. Why haven't you got your cell phone on? So it's not only having to have one, but you've got to have one with you and you're, it's there, part of you almost, which is probably what it's going to become. So I think networking has been a, a critical thing that I don't see that it was predicted by science fiction or scientists even, say 40 years ago. Just didn't, and, and it has completely changed how we are and how we interact. Do you think artificial intelligence will ever be at a level where robots or androids will be coexisting with humans? I think when we look at artificial intelligence, it's a very broad area. And one project that I'm involved with takes brain cells, can be human brain cells, and puts them in a robot body. And the number of brain cells is, at the moment, technically limited to maybe 150,000 but in future, potentially, there could be many more. So there you've got one form of artificial intelligence, a soft form, where well, we can actually build brains, we can make them and put them into robot bodies. And I can certainly see something like that coexisting in some way. But if we look at artificial intelligence in terms of a computer system, then it already has many advantages. The, the mathematical abilities, the memory functions, the speed and power of communication are already far better than those in the human brain. Um, and hence, if we look at using those advantages in a, a robot body, then potentially it could be something like iRobot, where you've got humans and robot technology. They don't have to look like humans or Arnold Schwarzenegger. They can look like pieces of technology, as most of the technology does. But certainly can, can inter and probably do interact even now. Um, how much they're going to move around like humans, to have arms and legs like humans, well, we'll see. In some circumstances, clearly that's useful if you want a, a friend around the home or a, a child wants a play friend. And so so there's, there's possibilities there. Um, but I think many pieces of technology with artificial intelligence coexist with humans now. Um, I, I guess the big question is if that artificial intelligence becomes much more powerful and if it has the capabilities to do something that you don't want it to do, will we allow the machines to do that? I, I think we probably will, without realising it will defer to the AI more and more and create something of a problem. In Japan, uh, a lot of Japanese scientists have been looking at robots as, uh, you know, sort of carers, I guess, in people's homes, um, you know, to take some of the strain away from their health system. Yeah. I mean, can you see that happening more and more with, uh, in the UK? Do you I think definitely in the, the Western world, UK included, we have a growing number of older people proportionately and at the same time a falling number of younger people to do work to keep older people living. So one obvious if you, thing, if you like, or way to go is to put robots in the home of one form or another, more technology to help with 
memory systems that old people might have problems with, to fetch and carry, to lift, to, and all sorts of things just around the home. I, I think we're going to see more of that, no question. Very often the older person may well have a bit of money to spend on the latest system. And as we do that, so the technology will develop more and more. And it will have to develop physically in terms of moving around in the home and also in terms of interaction, communication. It will need to know what the person wants exactly and to learn and adapt. So AI technology will be part of that. So I certainly see that being an enormous area of growth in the next 10, 20 years. So what's next for uh, Professor Kevin Warwick? What do you perceive as being your biggest challenges going forward? I've got three challenges at the moment. One with what we call a rat brain robot, but it is integrating human brain cells into the robot body, getting it to learn and adapt and communicate with it. We want to communicate with this robot that has a brain with human brain cells. I, at the same time, working with the Radcliffe Hospital, Tipu Aziz, a neurosurgeon there, trying to help people with Parkinson disease and using artificial intelligence to understand what Parkinson disease is about. The present time, with the results we're getting, it looks as though there may be different types of Parkinson disease. And if we can really understand that more, then maybe people will be able to be treated in different ways that is more specific, if you like, to their needs. And that's a direct application of artificial intelligence to help people uh, who have a problem. Um, I think the biggest thing for me, uh, I do see brain-to-brain -brain communication as a realistic way forward for us to communicate. But we need to carry out the first experiments. We need to actually send signals from brain to brain. And I would very much like to be part of that. Means having a brain implant, but great. How does your wife feel about that? <laughs> My wife has had implants in the nervous system. She does see herself um, brain implants as being quite dangerous. So she's not keen herself to be involved. Um, but she knows that I'm pretty determined about it, so uh, I, I think she'll just have to put up. But she'll be there, hopefully, to support me. But, of course, if it goes right, then we've not got a problem. I mean, uh, we're talking about Parkinson's um, and also thinking about senility. Are these conditions that you think we could find a cure for through AI and uh, your work? I think if we look at things like Parkinson's disease, dementia, um, strokes, um, where it, the standard human form now, more people are getting older, so we're seeing more prevalence of these problems. There are a number of ways we can tackle. We, we're seeing with deep brain stimulation, we can use electronics to counteract the effects of Parkinson's disease and depression and so on. But we have the possibility there, using artificial intelligence with the technology, to actually improve the situation more by understanding the diseases a little bit more and applying the appropriate signals. But with what we're doing with our rat brain robot project, we're looking there really at seeing how neural pathways develop, learning, and how memories are retained to the extent that if we can apply a few extra brain cells or even a few stem cells that are trained into retaining the memories, that hopefully we can then use the same approach within human brains in the future. So it may well be literally as we go into the future for something like dementia that you will be able to have a few brain cells, fresh brain cells, to freshen up how your brain is operating or even small silicon cells that operate in the same sort of way. So I think we're going to see much more technology to help various neurological problems in the future. Kevin, how would you like to be remembered? <laughs> oh dear. Um, I think ultimately the thing that gives me most joy is working with the surgeons at the Radcliffe Hospital and if I could be remembered for helping a bit um, with 
problems such as Parkinson's disease to develop the technology and so it's helped some people. Even if it's just given a few people a bit of hope that maybe the technology will be better in the future. Um, but I think scientifically the, the thing that I am happiest or proudest about was the first nervous system to nervous system communication that we actually made it happen. To me that's the basis for thought communication and we actually did it and it was cool, it worked and we did it in the UK and you can do things like that here.